Hi, Josh. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Pretty good. How are you? You look remarkably uh, calm and... Equanimous? Yeah, uncommonly equanimous. What's up? I feel super equanimous. Yeah, let me tell you what's up. First, let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are Josh Summers, uh, meditation teacher, yoga teacher. And we're going to talk about meditation retreats. I just... Um, got back from one, a 10-day retreat a few days ago, and that's what put me in the mind to talk about them. Uh, you're an appropriate person to talk to for a number of reasons, not just that you are a meditator and have been to a lot of retreats and are a medita meditation teacher and a yoga teacher in, I guess, the yin yoga tradition. Is that right? The currently hot yin yoga space? The hot yin yoga space, like uh, surging. Um, and, uh, and you're surging within that space. So congratulations. Um, and also we should mention your podcast, by the way, Everyday Sublime, which is related to all this. And, but you are, um, you are going to lead a, you're going to lead a yoga retreat soon. Is that right? Uh, it's more of a meditation retreat actually. Oh, is it really? Yeah, it, it would, it, it's for people in a yoga training and, and also open to people that are not in the training, but, uh, it's, it's meant to give people that are in their development as a teacher, a, an in-depth experience of meditation so that they okay. have a better sense of what's going on in, 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 inside the minds of their students. Okay. So the idea for this conversation arose while I was on retreat, because when you're on retreat, all these things are happening that seem intense and you want to talk about them. And of course, you can't talk because it's a silent meditation retreat. <laughs> you, don't, <laughs> you don't talk to anyone. And um, so we're doing this. And I wanted to start out by talking about retreats um, in a way that I hope will be of interest both to people who've been on them and meditate and to people uh, who may ha haven't been on them and maybe don't even meditate. Uh, I, I, I suspect there are some misconceptions float, floating around about meditation retreats. Maybe we can dispel some as we begin to talk about this. And then later in the conversation, uh, we can um, talk uh, more in depth about our own practices, maybe our experiences on retreat and so on. Um, your mileage may vary. Everyone's experience on retreat is different. People sure. tend to take different approaches to meditation and so on. So uh, for starters, what do you find are some common misconceptions about retreats or some underappreciated things about retreats? And maybe we should say that the retreats we've done, I think, have tended to be in what you could call the mindfulness meditation tradition. Maybe they've also gone under the rubric uh, of Vipassana. I don't Vipassana. think we need to get into those terms exactly right now, but just to specify that we don't, I don't go on these like Tibetan things where you're visualizing jewels, trees and stuff like that. Yeah. So I, I think that's important to emphasize that we're both coming more or less from the same lane, mm -hmm. uh, which is the Vipassana insight tradition. It does not, a ton of bells and whistles attached to that style. So the, some of the, right. the visualizations or chanting or prostrations and that kind of thing doesn't. We, we doesn't, did, we did a little, you do a little chanting sometimes on these. We did a little, but it's not the center uh, by any means. Exactly. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what you think of the common misconceptions too. I, you know, I have three big ones and there may, this may overlap with yours, but one is that when I talk to people about the, the prospect of going on retreat, one of the first things they, they kind of get rattled by is the idea of being silent for so long that somehow the condition of silence will drive them batty. Like they'll be shoved into the back of a dark cave and so there'll be some sort of psychological implosion within the cave. Which um, could happen. We should say, you know, it, I, I, I often say retreats are extreme sports for the mind and they, uh, you, things can get intense, and they can get darkly intense, and some people have a terrible time. Everyone I've recommended do a retreat has been a satisfied customer, but most of them have had some intense, not altogether pleasant experiences at some point on the retreat. Yeah, hopefully that would be the case. Um, and I can see there definitely, there's a, there's a, a literature out there around negative experiences, which I'm, I think you've you're familiar with negative experiences that people have. And, and that, one of the questions that we can get into later is how much are those negative experiences a function of the approach that people are taking within the retreat hmm. versus, you know, the dynamic or the broader dynamic of retreat itself. 
Um, so, you know, that's one, the silence. Then the, the, the and, next and so, one. Wait, first of all, so the silence does, per se doesn't bother you much. In many ways, I find it a relief. There are none of these awkward moments where, oh, you're supposed to say hi, or you're supposed to introduce yourself. You supposed, No, you just don't make eye contact. It's very simple. And everyone understands it. <laughs> well, yeah. And then, but then there are other people that are, that are kind of stretching, straddling that line where they do make eye contact and smile and, and bow and pranam or whatever it is. You know um, what I do with those people? I don't smile back. No, actually, I, I, that doesn't happen much. I mean, most of the people, I should also say I was, well, no, I won't say that. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, 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 I don't want to muzzle you here, Bob. You know, you're, you're fresh off the retreat. You've got a lot to say. And <laughs> I've been silent for a long time. Yeah. Um, you know, just, well, as you, as you suggested, I do think um, that's one of the surprises people find within the experience that the, that the silence itself is a pleasant condition that there is enough communication that occurs non-verbally that you don't feel isolated. You don't feel alone um, in a, to a certain degree. And you're usually hearing a Dharma talk, every evening from a teacher and getting some instruction from a teacher. So you're hearing words. Um, I wasn't getting a Dharma talk every evening with this retreat for, for reasons maybe I'll get into, but, but you know, you're hearing words and then usually there's at least once a week when you either have a one-on-one -on -one session with a teacher or a group of you meet with the teacher and you all voice any issues you're having. So it's not quite as austere as it sounds, but. Right. And I, you know, just to, to, to build on that, I would say in many ways, you, some people find that you feel more connected to people in the silence than you do, mm -hmm. say, even in your normal life. Mm -hmm. you know, there, there's a kind of a warmth of connection that, are, that starts to get generated over the course of the retreat. Um, but the, the, the other big one really is just the, sort of the the prospect of the length of the retreat. And I know you've talked about this and I've iterated more or less the same things you've been reiterating, which is that shorter retreats, whether it's a day long or a week weekend retreat are in my opinion, monumentally more difficult than say a seven day or nine day retreat. And I, th I think that point is not intuitive to most people that haven't done a retreat before. They, they kind of think that they just, they'll, they'll tiptoe into the shallow end first and play it safe with a, with a day long or something like that. But that, that can be actually more challenging um, hmm. for ways that we might want to get into. Now, wait, you're saying which can be more challenging? The the uh... the shorter retreat, the day long, the the the, the two day type experience. Well, in my experience, you don't start to get benefits until you know. I mean, the, the first two days are the hard part of a retreat. You, then you may have a hardness may recur, but you you um. In my experience, it's kind of. It's usually day three before I'm going, yeah, this was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and, and so, you know, in, in, in the tradition that we're in, there's this collection of mind states, which is really a short list for usual suspects of difficult mental energies that assail meditators when they just sit down and try to look at their experience for, in a sustained way. And those mind states are called the hindrances, as you know. Yeah. Um, and, the hindrances. Why do I know hindrances? Yeah, we all do. And they're not unique to anybody. That's why they're kind of these experiential universals. Um, and it, like you're saying, on average, it takes two to three, maybe four days just to get familiar with those patterns and then also develop some skills to relate to those patterns and sort of start to experience so, so you yourself should list, you should list a few of the classic hindrances. i mean there's actually a list of hindrances in, yeah. in buddhism right so you're talking about what things in particular the classic list includes things like desire desire for pleasant things um, whether it's pleasant sights sounds tastes touches smells thoughts aversion to things just the disliking mind that's a hindrance agitation or restlessness is a hindrance doubt and sleepiness. Now I went out of order there, but that really just is a, is a shorthand for anything that arises in your mind that, that makes whatever's happening more unpleasant than it needs to be. Okay. And, and, and so, you know, if you'd go on a shorter retreat, the majority of your, your uh, awareness sort of highlights the experience of those states arising and and you kind of just sit within that. And then by the time you get through the first day and working with those, it's time to pack up and go home. Mm -hmm. So 
as you, what you described, I think is very common for many people. And it, 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 I hesitate to say how long it takes to sort of taste what's on the other side of the hindrances, but it's usually within the range of two, four or five days. And I think, um, you know, in terms and, and, of- and, 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 you know, you're, you're, you're now more of a, a seasoned meditator yourself. And what's interesting, I think, is that, it, it, you know, regardless of, of your, of your uh, resume in terms of how many retreats someone's done, everybody knows that that's what comes up the first several days. Right. Mm-hmm. Whether you're a brand new beginner or more of a seasoned practitioner, right. it's just, it's just, you should have been warned, even if it's your first one, that the first couple of days may be, may be tough. Uh, at the same time, I mean, but, but the other striking thing to me is, is very striking on my first retreat. And I met you at the end of my first retreat. And, and I don't even remember what I said to you, but I was probably rhapsodizing about how mind blowing my experience had been. But in any event, the, um, What's also striking to me is just how different, you know, later in the retreat, once you've really sunk into the zone or some zone, um, how different your experience can be from ordinary waking experience. Uh, that's especially true maybe if, you're, if your uh, meditation practice has not been all that robust or effective going into it. And that's the condition I went into this retreat in. I mean, I was still doing my morning meditation, but it was kind of perfunctory. wasn't doing much for me. Um, but anyway, the, uh, you know, you can, amazing things can happen in your head, you know, <laughs> uh, without taking drugs. That, that's one of the lessons of meditation retreats. Sure. And I, and I think, you know, anybody that takes to this has, to, in my opinion, has to have had some kind of experience like that in within the practice where they where they experience themselves in a completely different way from what they're used to what their normal way of being is and and that that is what is on the other side of the the hindrances and normally you know our whole our personality is some collection of the hindrances you know what what do you like and dislike and what annoys you and what what draws you and inspires you like those those that's your normal sense of self is right. sort of is built around those. Well, those and, and, and those two hindrances, in a way, in Buddhism, are identified as the fundamental problem. Let alone meditation or meditation retreats. Just the desire for certain states and the aversion to other states. Those are that's the fundamental problem. In in uh, according to the Buddha, right? With 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 being human. Um. So if you, to the extent that you get, to some extent past those, yeah, experience changes. Right. Yeah. Not that I've never entirely overcome them, but. Well, I mean, I've heard enough of what, of your experiences and the way you've, you've talked about it. There's, it's clear that you've, you've definitely experienced yourself momentarily or in, even for a sustained period of time, temporarily freed of kind of the, the impingement of those states. And that's a very, I mean, what, what, what exists in that, that, that temporary uh, sort of appeasement of those states is, is a quality of peace and happiness and you can call it whatever you want, contentment, joy for no particular reason other Mm -hmm. than they're not arising or they're not operating in the same way. Yeah. You just look around and things seem satisfactory to say the least, you know, that's, that's the state you're in. Whereas we are designed as animals to be in a constant state of unsatisfactoriness. In fact, you know, uh, the, the term dukkha that's often uh, translated as suffering, some people would say could be translated as unsatisfactoriness. Because again, that is uh, the human condition. It's the impediment to enduring happiness. And um, yeah, no, it, it, it's, uh, and in my experience on retreats, and uh, this state also entails a deeply enhanced appreciation of beauty. I mean, that's part of the contentment with the world is just seeing it as beautiful, right? Uh, I mean, the obvious candidates being flowers and so on. I mean, if you, you walk outside and flowers may seem more vibrant and more striking and you can just sit there and gaze at them and like them, but also things like there was this, I was doing walking meditation And there was at kind of the end of the walk, there was this pile of rotting wood. They they had been cut as logs and then just left there in kind of disarray. And they were about half rotted. And that 
was pretty damn good looking too. <laughs> well, I mean, this is this gets into sort of the. It's hard. It, it, it's hard. Actually, I don't know how you find this, but it's hard to speak about this without feeling like you're you're dipping you're into just hackneyed cliche. Yeah, I know. I, that's that's part of the problem. Yes, it is like. Yeah, it sounds like cliche, or it sounds like you're high, right? And there are similarities i think between uh between your state of consciousness under the influence of some drugs and this except there are there are differences that i think mostly speak in favor of this in other words you're not gonna you know if you compare this to marijuana or something you're not gonna feel hazy and drowsy in two hours Mm -hmm. your recollection is not going to be dimmed you know it's it's fundamentally a state of clarity that i don't think carries the kind of cost that uh, an experience that's in some ways comparable but chemically induced at least via those avenues like cannabis might carry if that makes sense does that does that make sense to you it makes sense to me i I mean i I don't know if you want to get into it but there is the instead of cannabis you could talk about potential similarities differences with something like psilocybin yeah which is the one the one that people are talking about more being more similar in terms right. of the, the quieting of the default mode network in the brain and, and uh, the kind yeah. of a, the absence of got- self that comes. But what were you going to say? Uh, yeah, we should say the default mode network. It's a part of your brain that's very active when your, 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 your mind is just doing what it normally does, which is like roaming from place to place. And um, when you're not, engaged in some focused task, you're not reading a novel, you're not doing some job that requires concentration, your mind just wanders. The default mode network is active. When people do mindfulness meditation, there's a tendency for that to get calmed. I mean, well, first of all, you can, they will tell you their mind's not wandering. And then uh, the MRIs confirm that the default mode network is not active. And you're saying that tends to be true of psilocybin, and, and do you know if it's true of cannabis? Just out of curiosity, have they done the studies? I have not seen anything on cannabis or on that. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, there's, I mean, you had Michael Pollan on, he spoke about that. And yeah. he talks about that. Uh, in fact, in the back, back of his book on how to change your mind, he was, uh, he was talking to Judd Brewer, who's one of the leading neuroscientists mm-hmm. researching the default mode network. Um, and these other guys, I haven't been able to track these down, but there's a book came out maybe a year back or so called Stealing Fire. Uh, Jamie Wheel and another guy, they're kind of looking at how to hack flow uh, and f- or optimize flow states. And they, they talk about the, the neurobiology of, being, of, of, of deep meditation and psilocybin or psychedelic trips and flow states of intense athleticism as more or less being uh, the same. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, actually, the reason... Uh cannabis came to mind is you know one one interesting thing about retreats to me is i usually get in a state where i just have much more control over my state of consciousness than i have in in the sense that well let me give one example you know you gave me some guidance before a retreat i did years ago where i tried some things and and got some interesting results and i remember one example was i got into a state where I could control my level of bliss by lifting my eyes up or down. Like I would lift them up. My eyes were closed, but I would look up and bliss would just like pour in. Mm. And I could, and sometimes you'll get to be too much. I'd be like, whoa, there's such a thing. <laughs> there's such a thing as too much. So I'd level my eyes out. You can. Bob, let it, let it in, Bob. No, no, actually, I want to talk about that later because bliss is not the goal of mindfulness meditation. And yet, uh, a certain amount of it can naturally arise. This is a whole interesting subject in its own right, how you um, might want to calibrate your bliss and for certain purposes not let it get uh, to, to a very high level. But anyway, um, this, this, this time uh, I was – just to give people an example of like levels of control that aren't, are not accessible to me in normally. If I'm not on retreat, I, I wouldn't be able to do this so easily, but 
um, I there was a thunderstorm and I, I was kind of a riding, uh, I forget what I'd done that was distracting. I had a midday job, you know, usually on those retreats, you have like an hour long job to keep the cost down. People pitch in and, and do everything. And I had this like dishwashing job and I think it was in the wake of the, my whole, so I had kind of a mid afternoon break and I think maybe I'd also washed my clothes or something, but for whatever reason I hadn't meditated for a few hours and I wasn't in a super mindful state and I was kind of distracted and I, I walked into this, you know, onto this kind of porch and there was, it was, it had started to rain and there were some people, some fellow retreatants who were kind of blissing out on it, or at least they were like looking out, seems pretty happy. And, and, and I wasn't really in that frame of mind, but I knew it was within my power to get there pretty quickly. So I just closed my eyes to focus on like about 10 or 12 consecutive breaths very closely, closely in a way that is less easy when I'm off retreat, right? But but ex- with exquisite closeness, and, and that's all it took. And I remember thinking, you know, that is as reliable as like doing a small bong hit or something, right? <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, it, when you're on retreat, it it's like it's almost like pushing a button sometimes to to change your consciousness in a way that you want to. And indeed, suddenly I was in this state where the thunderstorm was this magnificent experience. It seemed like my perceptions were much more fine grained. My appreciation of like the patterns of rainfall, the beauty of that, uh, and so on. The thunder was, you know, I, I like would close my eyes and kind of the form, the audio form of the thunder would assume visual form. So I could kind of see the thunder coming toward me as I heard it. And it was just, you know, it was a completely awe-inspiring experience and it just amazes me that I can get to a point on retreat where that is within my control you know Mm -hmm. like you pause and 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 spend 45 seconds and you alter your state of consciousness and 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 I'm sure there are really experienced meditators for whom everyday life is more like that yeah well in in the retreat I think I think what you're getting to get getting at there is that in the retreat there just by dint of being on the schedule of the retreat, right? And and I'm not original in saying this, but by 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 just following the schedule, there's a momentum of presence and a sensitivity of attention that deepens just by sort of staying in 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 the track of the retreat. By schedule, you mean the scheduled meditations? Just just showing up to the meditation, doing your best, doing your best at whatever you're trying to do within the meditation, doing the walking meditation, just maintaining a continuity of attention as much as possible throughout the day that has a, there's a kind of force in that in a way it, it has a, a, a charge behind it. And so you could step out of it, maybe like you were describing to do your laundry for a little bit, but you, and you, 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 I got to thing you on this, Bob, you judge yourself for being unmindful, which. Well, we, you should first ding we, me for, for being unmindful because what they would say on retreat is while you're doing your laundry, you know, pay well, attention what, to what you're doing. Be mindful. You shouldn't get out of the zone while you're doing your library. Now, I know you're going to double ding me because I just chastised myself again. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, uh, but we we got to get out of that. That, 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 that negativity, man. I got to get over the negativity. I know. You know, I that, I would, that's another problem I have with myself. Are you going to ding me for that? Criticizing myself for being negative? You're the one who brought that on. Maybe we should stop recording and just have a little intervention on the side. Yeah, I could use one. Um, well, no, I mean, look, you, you, whatever you did, you did it with enough. You didn't like you didn't put your your light co- colors into the dark colors, did you? In the laundry, I don't do that in general. I just throw it all together. I've never. <laughs> anyway, what I'm trying to get at is, you had enough presence to do your laundry, so you can like let yourself off your hook about being whatever it meant to be unmindful in that state. My the point I'm trying to make is though that even though you might have these little moments on a retreat where you step out of the, kind of the intensive focus of attend, attending to what you're doing, there's a generalized momentum developing. And so you could slip back into that kind of that zone, what you're, you're referring to uh, when the storm comes in. And um, I think that you're describing in a way a feeling of facility when certain capacities of mind mature. like that. That there's a that that when you become more 
aware. Uh, there's a, a, an attention to detail. It's easier to, to, to lock in on that and, and, and sort of direct it a little bit more than, than when those capacities are in a more of a weakened or uh, undernourished state, if you will. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I should say, by the way, on this retreat, there actually was no schedule. I was at the Forest Refuge, uh, which is, you know, the Insight Meditation Society in Massachusetts. We've both done a lot of retreats there. There's a retreat center per se where they have very scheduled retreats. Forest Refuge for, uh, you know, at least somewhat experienced meditators often has retreats that are not structured at all. You're pretty much on your own. And, and that's what this was. But I was doing my, I was doing my, you know, four or five hours of sitting meditation a day and, and, and some walking meditation and so on. So. Um, yeah, I mean, going to, I mean, so just on that note too, uh, you know, the, the retreat, the main retreat center, um, they have a very specific schedule that pe- mm-hmm. people follow. And I actually have found that that's, that's a real support. So for new people, you know, I don't, again, if we're, if we're, mm-hmm. our audience is intended to, to reach people that might be interested in this stuff. It is it really, the schedule itself is such a support. I think that, mm-hmm. you know, just sort of let yourself settle into it, follow along with it. Um, where, whereas what you did, and I've, I've gone to the forest refuge too. That is, I'd be curious to how you found it, but I, I find that a much, a significantly more difficult retreat because you have to cultivate your, or develop your own schedule and stick to it. And then there's no, there's not as many bells to t- tell you when to do what. I loved uh, it. You loved it. Yeah. Because, I mean, I, I didn't, I wouldn't say I developed my own schedule, but I wrote down my every every sit and every walking meditation session and I had a rough goal in mind as to what I wanted to have done by the end of the day you know five hours of sitting whatever and um and what I liked about it well first of all it's a little less crowded than the main center and a little you know it's a little more personal space but one of my I, I agree with you first of all like certainly there's a lot to be said for the schedule. Beginners should definitely do that. My first retreat, I was religious. I did every single, you know, they're not taking attendance. You could skip sessions, but I did everything. I did the sitting. I did the walking. I got great results. Uh, I had a, you know, a near uh, the equivalent of a psychedelic experience. Not that that's the goal, but I had one of those like amazing mind blowing experiences as well as just the mindfulness uh, that we've been discussing more broadly. And, um, and so on. That, that's all great. But a frustration I have with a lot of structured retreats is like, I'll show up for a sit and I just want to sit. And the teacher will have some kind of agenda. Like, you, you know, like they'll decide that this is the session where they're going to do 15 minutes of guided meditation at the beginning. Sometimes you benefit from that. Uh, or, <laughs> we're still <laughs> it'll be meta it'll be loving kindness which i just i'm sorry never works for me i should it, it should well we're 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 in alignment there yeah okay so force enforce meta is just going to cultivate the opposite meta, yeah, so you, meta is you're, a, you're actively down on loving kindness meditation i'm like actively down on the formulaic form of loving kindness meditation i i and this is something we can get into in the in the shop talk too i i think the qualities that are intended to be cultivated in a formulaic pro- practice like that can develop in a different way. Yeah. Well, the- I, I, I think they naturally tend to, I mean, my big thing is just do mindfulness meditation. And if it works, you will wind up having a more charitable disposition toward your fellow human beings, including rivals and enemies. In my experience, it, it, without, trying to, you know, as you say, in a kind of formulaic way, uh, foster. And that. And now, that said, loving kindness works for a lot of people. It has worked, I know, and it's great, the, the, the so-called loving kindness meditation. But anyway, I was just saying, I like going into a sit in the meditation, I'm just knowing, like, I'm just going to be able to sit and, and you know, and, and not whatever. Not have any intrusion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. no. You're, the, I mean, you're right in, in that other s- scenario. You never know what the teacher is going to come in with. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the other misconceptions, I think, and this can maybe move us into another topic, but 
is what what the agenda of the retreat slash meditation is in, in itself, right? Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people think that in order to go on to a retreat, they a either have to have a temperament of a meditator already of a good meditator already. Um, I am proof that that's not the case. But I'm glad you glad to hear you say that. Um, or that, but then also connected to that, that when you go on the retreat, that it's meant to be kind of this spiritual vacation where you're going to be in a very pleasant, soothing experience. Right. The spa, be, the kind of spa scenario. Right. You, and there'll be a, a massage at 12 and, or, right. or <laughs> that kind and of there, there, look, there are places like that, I'm sure, but right. IMS is not like that. I would say on the austerity spectrum, IMS is, uh, I don't know, medium austerity. I mean, there's also these Goenka retreats, in, in, uh, including in Massachusetts, that are, I think, more austere. But, um, yeah, for example, was- you can't sit in a chair. If, you're, if you've got a bad back at Goenka, right, they won't, they won't let you sit in a chair. And they won't. I, right. I, oh, have you you not done a Goenka retreat? I have never done one. The first time I inquired into it, I was already having back. I was already old enough to be having a little back trouble. Yeah. Um, without alienating listeners that may really appreciate the Goenka style. Um, oh, I think I, I've heard great reports. I'm just I'm just uh, yeah. saying it's it's more austere in some ways than it's definitely, it's definitely more austere. I've done one. There's no there's no walking meditation for one too. Like the, you're just basically on. 10 minutes before the hour, you get a, a bell that allows you to go to the bathroom. And, but then at the, at the hour, you're meant to be back on the cushion. So it's just hour after hour after hour. And l- let me interject that Goenka is G-O-E-N-K-A. That's the name of a person who, yes. who, who brought this to America. And he was, in fact, a teacher of the people who st- uh, some of the people who started IMS. He was one of Joseph Goldstein's uh, teachers, this Goenka guy. And, and he has a somewhat distinctive approach. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, no, Goenka, he's part of this lineage. The king comes out of Burma, similar to uh, the Mahasi method. So there's two main systems from Burma that got exported. One, and they're just, just different techniques of how to do the, or sort of achieve the same ends. Um, but yeah, the retreat for, in the Goenka style, wherever you go in the world, it's exactly the same formula um, of instructions you get and, and how they get titrated out. Um, Mike, you know... <sighs> One of the things that I uh, have questioned lately is like how austere does a retreat need to be to be effective? And I, I think um, there's a certain mindset that is, or a personality gets drawn to the idea of a hardcore, super intense retreat. Um, but I don't necessarily know that that's either you know beneficial or necessary in terms of experiencing the benefits of meditation. Um, and also, I think some of the hardcore stuff can be more destabilizing for people um, in some important ways. Yeah, I think different things work for different people in general. Um, we, I might also add quickly that I gather Goenka emphasizes the so-called body scans more where you systematically go through the parts of your body and focus on them. You know, yeah. mindfulness meditation, if you look at the the seminal text on mindfulness meditation, the Satipatthana Sutta, there's four basic areas of concentration, and the body is one of them. So you, you, you become mindful of your body. That's that's uh, part of it. And then mindfulness of breathing is a subset of that, I guess. Uh, but Goenka puts a lot of emphasis on that. I would say at IMS, there's a little more relative emphasis probably on mindfulness of kind of Thoughts, emotions, observing those things as they pass through your head, right? Um, I don't know. But uh, just to give some people a, some sense of both of what the breadth of what mindfulness means, it just kind of means awareness, so a, a kind of a careful uh, a, a attention to various things, including bodily sensations, emotions, thoughts, perceptions. And- well, the other, can I ding you again? Yeah. <laughs> the other thing I ding you on is you on your retreat you described distractions. I described and, and being. I described you, you being talked about you talked about experiencing distractions and 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 at least as I understand it from, from the perspective of mindfulness there are no distractions and that's I, and that, I would, but that gets to and that gets I, to I what, would disagree I mean if you're not mindful of something you you certainly you agree that it's possible to be having an experience that you're not mindful of right. 
Yes. Okay, well, that's what I'm calling a distraction, is, is it draws you out of a mindful state. Well, okay. Um, so this is, we may be ahead of where we want to be in, the, in our conversation. I'm, I don't I'm know, we've been ahead. talking for 35 <laughs> minutes. I guess we can start doing some inside baseball. Okay, inside baseball, fine. Okay, I would submit there are states that you can't, in order to experience this state, you cannot sustain quote, you're the kind of mindfulness you're describing to have the state. There are states of states of experience or even just experiences of ordinary experience, like experience, ordinary experience where you might be thinking about something. You can't experience the, uh, uh, that kind of uh, dynamic if you're fully present to it. Well, I mean, y- like in sort of the, 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 the present moment mindfulness in sense uh, squeezes it out of your, out of your, well, what's an example of that? I mean, I mean, there's certainly kinds of experiences I can't have while well mind, like, like I have a lot of trouble just being mindful of thoughts, but, but, and I think a lot for a lot of people that is being mindful of thoughts is more challenging than say being mindful of feelings in the sense of emotions. But, but what do you have in mind when you say there are certain kinds of things that inherently you cannot be mindful of? Uh, in the, I want to qualify that can't be mindful of them in the way you might be describing the, the way to be mindful. Um, so, and I think you just hit your hit, hit the nail on the head with this difficulty of being mindful of thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um, because, uh, as soon as you become aware of thoughts and and you don't, they don't, they don't, they they get interrupted. Exactly. So I think that begs the question, how do you get, how do you develop if your intention is to develop a broader awareness and understanding of your thought stream there's a case to be made i think to allow them to go on and actually not be fully present to them while they're occurring which is i'm in a minority when i say this i know that um but the, the but this gets to the to the the second point around the definition of mindfulness that as you i think opined on in a mindful resistance newsletter recently that the word sati is derived or is off is literally translated more as memory to hold, right. to remember to hold in mind. So there's a case to be made. I think that to get to know your thoughts, sati, I, did you say sati is the word that's translated as mindfulness? That's, that's the word in the Pali text yes. that we read as mindfulness. And, right. and, and yes, etymologically it has a close connection to the concept of memory. Right. Right. So, uh, I think there's a case you made that to, to get to, to bring more mind sati to your thinking that happens after the thoughts have occurred rather than so much while they're occurring. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think in this is an interesting point, I think in that sense, thoughts are just qualitatively different from feelings. And here I'm using feelings and it's kind of in the sense of emotions. The word, the word that's translated from Pali is feeling in, and is an important word in, in Buddhism is not really emotions, but leaving that aside, um, like just emotions, you can be having them and observing them and still have them some more and observe them some more, right? But you're right with thoughts. Once you're thinking about the thought, you're not having the thought anymore. And that's, and in a way that makes me feel less bad about the fact that I've had trouble being mindful of them because maybe, you know, they're just quality. That's kind of the point you're making. Thoughts are qualitatively different. You, the, what, if it's going to be phenomenologically different. What? Phenomenologically different. Well, sure. Uh, but, but even different, you're saying they're different in what mindfulness of them can mean. By virtue of their distinctive qualities, mindfulness of them just can't mean what mindfulness of feelings means because you can be mindful of a feeling, aware of a feeling as it continues. Yeah. Uh, as I, as I try to explain, you know, like right now I'm lifting up a teacup or the coffee mug and I, you know, I can be aware of this while it's occurring. Mm hmm. So right now I can be fully present and mindful of myself sipping this cup of coffee. But like that model of, of attention breaks down when you, when it applies to the mind itself. Yeah. Hold so, on. so, oh, so, and then you, you know, another example is, or could be uh, any kind of flow state experience. And I would put the territory of Samadhi states, deep states of absorption. Con- concentration, absorption. Yeah. Concentration, you know, you know, I don't know if you've had this wrestle with somebody else, but um, a lot of teachers I've had dislike the term concentration because it implies a kind of very narrowed focus 
Whereas samadhi, the, some of the terms that I've, I've heard used for it uh, are stillness or steadiness. Mm-hmm. So that you know, there's a sense of being still within a, a, a broad range of things occurring, but you're not necessarily myopically focused just down, drilling down on one one specific thing. No, but doesn't the absorption generally begin with successful concentration? Um, well, this gets back, to, back gets us back to the hindrances, mm-hmm. uh, those difficult mind states. But generally speaking, the models I've seen, and, and, and this rings true to my experience, is that when the hindrances are, in a sense, related to or are, are not operating in the same disturbing way in the normal state, when the hindrances are kind of at, at bay for a period of time, samadhi naturally arises. This is the steadiness, the stillness, like in the middle, like your, exp- your natural experience, it would be still if it weren't for the presence of the hindrances. Uh, that, sort of that's rat- the argument. Okay. Rattling. So, so yeah, you can, I think what you're, what you're getting at and uh, what you're speaking to is that the, the traditional narrative for how to get into samadhi, like the, 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 the normal instructions given are focus on one thing. Mm-hmm. And when your mind wanders, bring it back to that one thing and do like that. Like the, the breath, classically. Classically, the breath. Um, do that um, it over. It could be a mantra. Mantra. It could be, you know, chickpea. It could be a feeling of your hands on your lap. It could be the sounds of, of the environment. Whatever you're focusing on, you just bring your attention back to that again and again and again. And eventually, that, the, like we were talking about earlier, the momentum of that attention displaces the hindrances from the, your stream of consciousness and a sense of stillness arises. Mm-hmm. Uh, another way into that is just simply to develop a kind of a, a, an understanding and, and through the understanding of non-reactivity to the hindrances, to the difficult mind states. And a samadhi can emerge uh, independent of whether you're trying to focus on the breath or not. Okay. Does that make sense, at least conceptually? I, I mean, I guess. I, I, I mean, so, so you're saying, so... Um... So if it weren't for the hindrances, life would be samadhi. That that that's the that's part of the idea here, right? Like if it weren't for, um, well, let me uh, let me let me say something that may or let me let me Go for approach this from a totally different angle that may or may not be you may or may not be able to make a connection to this. One thing that occurred to me on this retreat more than on others, perhaps, is. Um, you know, if you start by focusing on your breath and you attain that concentration, it for me, it's always tempting to just focus more and more tightly on my breath because what tends to happen as I do that is I feel better and better up to and including a state of flat out, you know, bliss, right? And yet, um, if you're doing mindfulness meditation, bliss is not really the goal. The goal is to establish enough kind of equanimity to observe what's going on in your body, in your mind, sounds, whatever, from a different vantage point than you would normally bring to it if you weren't mindful in, in, in you know, in kind of regular um, life. And uh, so, I, I don't know. It just, I, I mean, it just, and it, this is kind of a challenge for me because, and so I, I find myself, and I don't know if you do this during um, sits, but like especially at a retreat, I like I have the capability to kind of pump up the bliss as high as I want it. And so I'll kind of get it to a certain level where I'm feeling good enough to be successfully mindful. And good enough means, among other things, devoid of the two hindrances we you focused on earlier, wanting some, you know, craving something or being averse to something. Um, I mean, I guess one th- I, I, I'm, I'm certainly accepting a close correlation between concentration or absorption, although I know you're saying you're not saying, um, and not being in the state of wanting something or wanting to get away from something. I mean, those are very closely related and I don't know. So there's this thing in mindfulness that you want to get to a certain, it's inherently, it, 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 it feels inherently good to become focused enough to be mindful, in my experience. Equanimity just feels good. Being somewhat liberated from this, 
you know, chronic desiring of something or to get away from something, it just inherently feels good. But and you know, well, while you're describing, I just want to just interject that, like that, the, the thing, the state that you're describing is also not one of apathy or indifference. Like you don't, you don't feel apathetic or indifferent to what you're experiencing, do you? No, I'm liking it. Right. And, and in that sense, I, I mean, and, and and all, and to the extent that I'm pursuing more and more bliss, I obviously haven't totally let go of one of the hindrances in a certain sense, right? I'm wanting more of something that feels good. Yeah, well, this is where, I, you know, I actually feel like I've heard you talk to various of your, your Buddhist teachers that you've had on as guests, and they've talked about this, but that, you know, the, the, the idea of eradicating desire entirely yeah. is, is kind of uh, a, you know, a misunderstanding of the, of, the, of the path, and that in some ways your desires are being refined and ele- upgraded. Like the things that you're seeing the limitations, the short, the shortcomings of normal desire. And you're actually in some sense, pardon the phrase, but you're kind of feeding on a different pleasure that's, that doesn't, ha- and, and, uh, that doesn't have the same, uh, cycle of suffering attached to it in a certain sense. And now granted, you could get attached to samadhi states or, or concentration absorption states yeah. that then, then can, uh, make your experience on retreat more frustrating if you're not in them. As, as one teacher I had once said, there's nothing that ruins a day of retreat than a really good sitting the first thing in the morning. Right. Cause then you're, you're cause it feels so good that you keep trying to replicate it. You keep trying to, well, it's not even just that you feel like, okay, I got it now. Mm. <laughs> like the, and, and you just sort of, you fantasize about what every sitting afterwards is going to feel like that. It's just going to be more of the same. And of course it's not. Which gets back to what I was trying to bring up earlier. It was like the whole, like the mindset that I think people go, go into the retreat with is this idea that it, it's about a specific outcome. Meaning like you're, you're going to do this, go through this, this process of being on retreat to get to certain measurable outcomes in your own experience, whether it's a greater calm, greater presence, less reactivity. And, uh, I think that, it's very understandable why people hold that uh, anticipation, but I do think it, it becomes something that it, that that anticipation itself becomes something that needs to be examined and maybe reframed that the, the point of the retreat isn't so much to get to these specific outcomes as much as it is just to be engaged in a process. And the process is one of, at least the way I would explain it is you're, you're cultivating an ability to to look into your experience in different ways and to dis- develop discernment and greater understanding around what it's like to be you in a, in a simplistic way. Yeah, but I mean, there's also, um, it's also just the case that, like, even even if you grant that, yeah, it'd be great to have the the, the peace of mind, the flow, whatever you're looking. For, you know, if you if you if you pursue it very ardently, you're actually less likely to get it, probably. On your feet. So, as a practical matter, even if you grant that those are the goals, it may be best not to think of them as the goals. Um, right. Right. Yeah. The, like your 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 ability to experience those 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 sought after states is inversely correlated to sometimes how much how 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 much you're striving to get to those states. You know, we. Um, I want to recount a set uh, an experience that I had this morning meditating. Partly because I think, although we may have by now lost everyone who who isn't uh, intimately familiar with mindfulness, I, I think uh, we we haven't talked much about some of the kind of concrete aspects of it. And um, this morning, I was uh, starting to meditate. And one thing I often do when I'm establishing concentration at the beginning is... Um, I may focus on my only the inhale of a breath, and then as I exhale, I may focus, like if there's a kind of recurrent, persistent sound, I may focus on that, and uh, and then on inhale, and then on that. And there was this nice sound, and um, I was, uh, you know, it was a kind of ta, 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 I was getting into it. And then I realized it was my faucet dripping, 
And I thought, you can't have your faucet dripping. You're wasting water. And what was interesting, he, th- this is just a kind of thing you would you might notice through meditation that you wouldn't ordinarily n- n- notice. I mean, ordinarily, what, what we would say about it, uh, uh, deciding to turn your faucet off is, oh, I realized it was my faucet, so I went and turned it off because I didn't, you know, want blah, blah, blah. And you describe it as this decision-making cognitive process. But what I, but I, what I observed as I was meditating was that there were these drip, drip, drip sounds that had had no connotation to me and no affective value. I didn't, I didn't think they were bad. I didn't think they were good. The flow of sound was kind of helpful and nice, but I didn't have any, you know, have any particular relationship to them. But then as soon as I thought, wait, that's my faucet dripping, I could feel that every drop sound, uh, elicited an aversive emotional reaction at a spe- in a specific part of my body, okay? And, and I couldn't live with, and, and I had to get up and turn it off. And, and this may not sound, this may sound trivial to people or something, but I, to me, one of the most interesting things about mindfulness is it can give you more insight into how the mind and human motivation actually work. And, mm-hmm. The actual fact of our thoughts and our decisions is that they are finely intertwined with affect, with positive and negative evaluation. And those are the dimensions that goad us into action, that get us to think certain kinds of thoughts, that get us to avoid certain kinds of thoughts. Everything in our ordinary life is loaded with these affective values, but we don't notice it because they're so finely intertwined and we think we're running the show, but actually we are being run by these, these affective signals. And, and so that's just a little snapshot of uh, uh, what I consider a very interesting kind of feature of mindfulness, a kind of insight it gives you into, into the way what is really governing your behavior. It, it, it's like, and, and interestingly, my original relationship to the drop sound, which is that it was neither bad nor good, according to Buddhism, that's the proper relationship in a sense, right? In other words, drops are not inherently, things are not inherently good or bad. It, we assign those values to things. And I mean, it may sound ironic to people that mindfulness led me <laughs> to, in some sense, be aware of this negative feeling because in a way, the mindful attitude toward things should involve not assigning value, right? It, 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 should, it should allow you to observe things without assigning that value, if that makes sense. Does that? It does. I'm, I'm trying to think through that a little bit. Um, where, I, where I tripped up a little bit was when you said the, the kind of the proper Buddhist way. I know. Of whenever I say something like that, you, I... Well, no, 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 because... because I just interrupt and say that I, I, I think... The original Buddhist texts are more fine with making with saying things like that than modern med- meditation teachers are. But go ahead. Well, no, no. Well, no. Actually, I'd, I'd go back to the more of the original text view because is, is the intention to have that pers- have that kind of awareness that does not assign value, or does, is it is the intention to see how how the the con- what conditions come together for the value to be placed on it and what conditions come together for there to be no value placed on it. And, 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 and not necessarily um, privileging one over the other, but just to have a sort of a broader sense of wh- what goes into creating and building your experience. Right. It's to be aware of the process of placing value on things. That's- right. One of the goals. And, 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 and it's and, not that, and, it's not that the values you've placed on things are always misleading, right? It's not that like, you know, you loved your daughter and so you protected her from a saber tooth tiger and that was bad. No, that was good. Uh, you valued life and that's good. That's fine. So, so to be aware of the placement of value on things isn't to say that the placement of value always misleads you. Right, because right. in the in the case, you, I mean, from from my perspective, you did the right thing. You got up right. and turn, turned out the faucet. That wasn't a like the, no, that wasn't a bad thing. I, I mean, but but uh, 
But this is where, you know, I think modern mindfulness does jive, does have run into conflict with the, the early version, which is that, uh, there is this premier, premium given to non-judgmentalness. You mean in the modern version? Yeah. Um, which I think becomes, becomes, uh, it, the way that, 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 uh, quality of mindfulness operates in someone's experiences, they, 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 they then end up judging themselves for having judgments about certain things. And in the early teachings, you know, I, what I see is a, uh, an emphasis on discernment and discrimination and wisdom, which is predicated on making better judgments. Well, I, I, I kind of agree, but I would say that in my view, the, the kind of early conception of enlightenment, of awakening, you know, this, this elusive state that you and I are never going to reach, at least in the, in, in my view, in the strict classic sense of the term. That is a state of making no judgment whatsoever, right? That is a, a state of not assigning uh, affective value to things, right? Do you not agree that that is the, the enlightenment in the strict early sense? Well, you'd have to say more about what you define as a strict early sense. Like, uh, because again, well, this, and it, no, we can, we can thread this back to what we were talking about earlier, like one potential interpretation of uh, the experience of Nibbana, which was the term that referred to a fire gone out, that the fire that's gone out is just the flames of reactivity that are fueled by, that are, that are fed by the hindrances. So well, you're, ex- wouldn't, wouldn't Tanha be the flame that has gone out? I mean, Tanha meaning yeah. kind of craving to, to encompass both desiring certain states and desiring to avoid other states. I mean, yeah, that's there's the, that's the flame, right? That's the fire. That's the fuel. That's the oil. That's that's feeding the lamp. The 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 the, the wick. The, the, we're mixing the metaphors, but okay. but the um, yeah, you know, it's but it's through understanding the tana, the thirsting, the craving that that gives grants you insight into what how you're holding on to it, how you're relating to it, and then you when when it's relinquished, there's a sense of peace and coolness from the, those flames dying down. Right. And um, I don't think, I think what you're, the way you're talking about it, you're, you're making enlightenment sound like this um, kind of ultimate state within which Tana never re-arises. No, there, there's no more craving. And, and, I, and I grant that's a possibility. It's certainly not my experience. Um, well, of course, it's not our experience. <laughs> right. It's too hard to attain. <laughs> <laughs> but I think... The, but that, I think the, the, the cessation of the process of suffering, der, the, the derivative of the, of the presence of Tana, I think is far more within reach than like that you might be giving it. Oh. That, and I, I would say that I would even submit you probably wouldn't be going on retreats if you hadn't had some direct experience of that. And I think I would even go even further and say everybody that does a yoga class, this is why I think yoga is so popular. At the end of the yoga class, you lie down on your back. You're in a shavasana, the corpse pose. You just lie down. And uh, a lot of times people feel that they're just completely content. That It doesn't matter what's oh, going sure. on around them. So the, contentment are possible, but that's different from saying the permanent extinction of suffering is a realistic aspiration for 99.9% of humankind. Right. And that's where I would start to question the, the qualifi- qualifier of permanent extinction well Which okay is- then we agree i mean i agree that so long as you're not talking about permanent extinction of suffering but but i think i think in the early text the, the, yeah there was the idea that you that there are people like the buddha who have attained enlightenment and that involved the permanent end of dukkha i i i think that's maybe i'm wrong i'm not i'm certainly not a scholar of early buddhist texts but i you know i, I mean you know nirvana is uh it's a distinct state i mean i mean again r- r- i mean you know it involves after all uh the end of the you know recurring endless series of life cycles that you're otherwise right no, no this is where it does get like see i you know i we, i i'm re- i'm reluctant to to adopt some of these metaphysical positions on nirvana 
Oh, well, I don't, I don't, I don't get, no, I don't have a view on rebirth or any, I'm not, I'm not necessarily taking that part seriously. I'm just saying that uh, the fact that it was in that context in, in early Buddhism, the context of ending the, you know, the, the, the cycles of the, the, the recurring cycles of, of life suggests that it was, it was this really distinct kind of place you got to. Right. Or there, what if, but what if it was more prosaic and referred to ending the cycles of repetitive neurotic patterns that continued, I, I, continued I certain that, aspects of suffering? I think that would be a metaphorical reading of the text. And I guess you're free to have your own metaphorical readings, but I don't think that's what they say. Uh, well, I mean, the thing I would say about that is like, how do you then, and this may be moving beyond where we want to talk about retreats. Yeah, we should probably get back to more concrete stuff after this. Go ahead and say one more thing on this. I was just going to say, like, like if you if you look at the Buddha's teachings in context, he was clear about something being the middle path. And the middle path is between an like, eternal truth or doctrines of eternalism and nihilism. And so I think he is walking that more pragmatic path between the two and saying, it's not about an absolute state you're trying to attain. It's, it's much more on the, down on the, on the, on the ground, looking at how certain mind states proliferate more reactivity and getting to know those and becoming more familiar. Like the, the third or the fourth noble, uh, fourth foundation of mindfulness looks at those hindrances and it's saying, if we come back to the hindrances again, it's saying, he's saying, be aware of them when they're arisen. Be aware of what conditions cause them to arise. Be aware of them when they've been abandoned. Be aware of what conditions support them being relinquished. And that, to me, kind of speaks to a different kind of process in relationship to the to your to the kinds of things that that spin you that tie you up. I'm not saying that all of this isn't a legitimate part of the Buddhist path. I'm just saying that I don't see a need to label it as enlightenment, and I don't. I don't, I don't understand, well, maybe I do understand it, but I don't agree with the modern tendency in some circles to say, yes, you can have enlightenment. Well, if you redefine enlightenment, of course you can. But to say you can have enlightenment in the sense in which it's meant in the strictest sense in the earliest text, I think is, is, uh, is just not realistic for most people. I, I don't, you know, that, that, that's all I'm quibbling with. I'm not saying that what you're describing is not really a natural and legitimate and important part of the Dharma. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not, you know, it's fine. <laughs> I'm fine with it. I think the, the bottom line is how does it affect how you engage with what you're, what you're, what you're working with? Yeah, I mean, uh, and I think enlightenment as a process is something to want to engage in, to become more enlightened. And, and closer to this idealized state that I maintain virtually none of us will ever reach. You know, and, may, and, and just to close out on this, this part of the chat, maybe I would, I, you, if you substitute the word liberation for enlightenment, like enlightenment does, really does sort of point at a particular state of, of yeah. state of experience that's and, not and changing. it's kind of a mistranslation. The, the term would be more legitimately translated as awakening, the poly. Yeah. Awakening, but even liberation, like if you're liberating yourself from something, like that's to me more, more interest than. Yeah, than yeah. again, I, but I think there are degrees of liberation. I, I, I don't hope to ever be completely liberated. What would that mean? It would mean I never had any gripes, and that ain't going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> All right. Well, what, what is, um, talk to me more about your retreat itself. Like you, you sound like you, you had some tastes of bliss and then you were, you were ambivalent around indulging yeah. the bliss or. Yeah. You know, I mean, I should say I, I happened to go into this retreat at a kind of juncture in my life when I needed to kind of make some decisions or move closer some, to some decisions, especially having to do with my professional life. So it, it wound up having a more pragmatic cast in some retreats. And I think that limited, I, and I think I made progress along that dimension, but that limited in some ways the depths I could reach in, in other respects. Um, but, uh, but I definitely, um, 
you know, I, I don't know what else to say. I mean, uh, you know, I, uh, I, um, so, so I had a question for you cause you did, you did put out your, your newsletter yesterday and you, and you wrote about, yeah. uh, about your retreat. And there was a phrase that I, that caught my attention where you said something like your, your, your meditations now post retreat were feeling more productive. Mm-hmm. And it, it occurred to me, and this may be in light of the fact that I just had a conversation with uh, Jenny O'Dell on her new book, How to Do Nothing, but she's, she's, her attention is sensitive to how we, kind of the, the ethos of productivity colonizes many spaces that we're in. And, and I'm, so I may be projecting too much on you here, but um, it's like this idea that the, the, the meditation is going to be good if it, it leads in a certain productive way. And I, I'd be curious to hear what you what you meant by I, that. I didn't mean productive in the sense of you know work output or economic output. I meant productive in the sense of uh, of, of leading to the state of mind. I would hope uh, meditation would lead to. You know, I also have a little bit of a gripe with this tendency in modern meditation teaching. You know, you shouldn't talk about meditation as being for anything. We don't have any. There's no good meditation, bad meditation. There sure as hell is. Come on. We all, you know, people meditate for a reason. They go to retreats for a reason. They meditate for a reason. Uh, And 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 there's such a thing as meditation not working. And you know, now you may it it may be true that getting hung up on whether it's working gets in the way of its working. That's a separate question. But the idea that you can't. You know, you know that we all say, oh, that wasn't a great sit. You know, that was a great sit. That wasn't a great sit. Experienced meditators meditators talk that way, and it makes perfect sense that they would because they're meditating for a reason. They want something. Well, yeah, and that's that's what the question I tried to raise earlier is like, what is the agenda of the meditation retreat? And if it's, you know, if you have a clear, like, if you have a clear sense of what you're trying to do, then yes, your metrics of whether it's going well or not are going to. We'll, we'll, we'll tell you that, but I guess what I'm holding, it's not that there isn't like good meditation experiences and um, pretty unpleasant meditation experiences. I grant that. It's just that even within the not so pleasant meditation experiences, something may be developing and there may be a way of learning and understanding about yourself within those difficulties. Sure. That's of value that, you know, on the simple, it's good meditation, bad meditation. You might not, you might not have any interest or, uh, connection to if you don't if you don't look into yeah, it no i don't i don't think productive meditation is just meditation that makes you feel good or meditation that makes you more efficient i mean for example that uh the the little episode with hearing the drips to my mind that was productive that was genuine insight into my motivational structure it was just an interesting thing to observe even though the moment of insight into what was going on was unpleasant suddenly it was unpleasant to hear the drops right. that's fine Right. Okay, so that, that that clears it up. I mean, I was trying to understand what you meant. Yeah, but I mean, you know, whereas when meditation, uh, like before the retreat, I would even, I, I would have been, like I said, my meditation had gotten to a point, um, you know, it had been years since a retreat, and my meditation had gotten to a point where it wasn't so productive. I would have been less likely to to really even make that observation as as trivial an observation as it sounds like. You know, like, oh, these drops, now that I've changed my framing of them, they're making me feel bad. Every drop hurts a little. Mm -hmm. That doesn't sound like a profound insight, but I would have been less likely to have it before the retreat, and that would have been a less productive kind of meditation. Right. That's that's what I was curious, what you meant by a less productive meditation, where you're not noticing that kind of granular structure of how you're processing your experience right see and that's that i'm not trying to get into the 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 experiential relativism or it's all good blah 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 there's no good or bad meditation right what what i'm trying to say is that even within what you might consider or classify as a less productive meditation you might not be aware of it but there may be qualities of your being that are developing ripening within what within a state or or experience of things that doesn't feel so productive so for example for example uh let's say you're meditating and and this happens on retreats so people that are going to do retreat that one thing that a difficult hindrance is the is the hindrance of sleepiness 
where you get tired and you get drowsy and it's particularly after lunch, you start to nod and, and do the head bob, not you, Bob, but the, the head bob kind of thing. And, you know, people feel like that, that this is wasted time, right? It, like their, 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 their clarity of attention isn't sharp. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're not able to discern the, the, the different elements of their experience, like the drip of the sound and then the twinge of unpleasant feeling in their body somewhere. They're not able to see that stuff and it feels like it's less productive, but I think there's a case to be made too that within the foreground of the sleepy state, there, there could be qualities of, of mind that are ripening in the background that you don't necessarily appreciate or perceive while they're occurring. So, and one quality might simply be tolerance. Like just by virtue of sitting through a groggy, fo- foggy, unclear state of mind where you're confused, you're not really sure what to do. But just by being with that, there's a way that a, 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 a level of tolerance may be increasing, which I think would feed into a, an ability to be with experiences beyond that particular one. Mm-hmm. It could be. I mean, I would say that if, if, if I have a whole session where all I do is just my mind just wanders the way it would if I were just walking down the street, and that's all that happens, and I manage to... to attain zero concentration and and no particular equanimity or mindfulness. I'm not sure how productive that is. I don't know. Maybe something's going on. Well, that's, 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 let me just be very transparent. Like when I give instructions now, I actually intentionally say, don't focus so hard on the breath. I don't even recommend the breath. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really try to suggest people start with a much broader, more open attention receptive to whatever might be going on with the permission to turn their attention to something specific if they felt they need it. Mm -hmm. And the idea in that is that you're leading with a gentleness uh, towards all experience so you can get to know it. Um, Now in doing that uh, at certain points, you may find there's a, there's a natural relaxation that comes that allows you to then, turn your attention to the breath and be with it in a sustained way without any kind of struggle. Yeah. Like there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a welcoming, I, uh, you know, a welcoming in your mind towards everything that there's just much less friction and it's easier to then focus on the breath. Um, Whereas, so the point that what you're talking about, like the difference between just going outside and and walking and having your mind wander, how would that be productive People have that fear in this approach to meditation too that I that I'm sharing, where you you do let your mind be open and vulnerable to wandering. There's a fear that you're you're just going to be wandering the whole time, and uh, I just haven't seen that to be the case. So there's a there's a imagined fear around unproductive wandering to the, throughout the whole course of the meditation when that that is probably unlikely that. That the body, even just walking outside, your body, you're going to be drawn to feeling your feet at times. You're going to be noticing your dog if you're walking your dog. You're going to be noticing somebody else. You're not going to be, a, i.e., lost in thought. Well, you know, no, but but if you're saying that's just generally not true of walking, then fine. Walking's just a good thing, and people should walk. I mean, that's, you know, I mean... I, I would say, I, for me, it also works in the other direction. In other words, first of all, yes, I do sometimes sit down and not focus on the breath. I may just uh, wait and see what arises anywhere in my body that gets my attention, and maybe it'll be a sound. Who knows? But but I would say that that will work. Uh, that is easier for me to do uh, sometimes if I've been working on the breath. So, for example, I might go into a retreat, my practice is a shambles. Um, I sit down. I I say, well, I'll just see what gets my attention. Kind of nothing does. It's monkey mind. No apparent progress. And then next time I'll say, okay, let's really work on the breath. It hurts. It's not working. But try to focus. It's not working. You try to focus. You focus. I, eventually, after two, three, four, five sessions, you're 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 getting better at the breath. Once I'm getting really good at focusing on my breath. Then I can do those other things. Like at the next sit, I can more readily just sit down and see what gets my attention in my body, and that and, and that will arrest my attention more readily, and 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 that will become that the non breath avenues, in other words, will be more open to me mm-hmm. 
after I've established concentration with my with my breath, if that makes sense. That's certainly the again the, the conventional narrative on how to settle down to to, to to use the breath first. Well, if it works, what what is the problem with it? If it works, don't if it if it yeah. ain't broke, don't fix it. I mean, what a, a big and maybe this is something we can move to now is the bigger challenge to me is uh, after a retreat. Right. So on retreat, you. Uh, are you know in a very different place than you were a week before retreat in terms of of your ability to sit down be mindful be mindful when you're not sitting just walking around and and, and being aware of things appreciating things in life but also being aware enough of the reactions you're having that you don't uh do regrettable things and so on and waste your time on hatred and whatever um but then you come back from the retreat there's a lot more stuff entering your mind and making it hard to concentrate when you sit down. Um, there are a lot more aggravations and so on. You can't devote as much time to the meditation as you were on retreat. Do you have advice to people about how to make the transition? Well, I, I know what you're going to say. <laughs> you're going to say, I already gave the don't advice. worry about it. There's no such thing as failure. No, well, no, it's, it's actually, it, there's a couple of ways we could talk about this. One is the frustration I think you're feeling on coming off of retreat is connected to ex- the experiencing the, the diminishment of the strength and momentum of both concentration and mindfulness that you developed while on retreat. Mm-hmm. So like the retreat, particularly the retreats that kind of that you're describing, they're, they're containers to build that momentum. And when you get off retreat, inevitably those conditions are no longer there. And the support container for that momentum diminishes. And you find that it's harder to be present or it's harder to catch things. It's harder to have that productive uh, noticing, if you will. Um, So, you know, but I, I guess I would start by questioning the premise from the approach to meditation at the very beginning, where rather than trying to keep certain things out of your meditation, if you actually have a more, I would say, holistic welcoming of the kinds of things you'd think about after the retreat, you let those kinds of things into your meditation a bit more, you may find that you have more presence to them as a result of being with them on retreat. And then when you re-encounter them, you're just used to being with them. So it's a little bit like... Uh, you know, it's a little simplistic, but you could think of the meditation more as a simulator and you get familiar with flying with, within certain dynamics on retreat, like the topics of what you think about or things that spin you out. And then you're just more familiar being aware, being with them post retreat. So it's, you know, there's a question that often we get, it's like, how do you apply the meditation to your life? It's a little bit of a cliche, but uh, a phrase that I've liked is that if you want to apply the meditation to your life, let your life into your meditation. And I think there's a case to be made too. If you, if you, this could be a metaphorical read of the Buddhist, Buddhist life, but you know, the night that he sat down on the Bodhi tree and apparently he attained enlightenment, right? Mm-hmm. You know, the story he's visited by the, the, the Buddhist version of the devil known as Mara. Yeah. And Mara sends an army of his daughters to tempt him. So there's yep. sense, sense desire. A lot like the Jesus story in the Bible, by the way, the Jesus in the wilderness story, but go ahead. Well, yeah, well, my take on that, well, there's, well, correct me, I, I don't, I haven't looked at this in a while, but there, there was also an army of um, terror, right? There was like these magical beings that were meant to scare the, the Jesus out of the, the Buddha to get him to move out of his seat, and that didn't work either. And then there's also the way that, that the devil appeared as uh, Gautama's father to guilt him to come back, right? So, saying that, you know, you, you know, if you sit here, it's fine. You know, the, our kingdom back home is going to go to, to rack and ruin. Don't worry about it. you attain your enlightenment and the family, family lineage is going to go to hell. We're fine. Really, really. We're fine. Yeah. Um, the thing that occurred to me in that story though, is that the conditions that visit him, the, 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 the devil, devilish demonic conditions that visit him are the conditions of his life in the palace. Mm-hmm. And it's, and it's, there's something about the, the recognition of them and our way of relating to them. And 
in the meditation that transformed how he related to them, which is basic mindfulness 101, but it's that he didn't escape the conditions of the palace in his meditation. His normal life fully presented itself within his meditation. And it was, it was through a transformation of understanding that he felt freed. Now, again, that could be a very secular, pragmatic, metaphorical interpretation of things, but I think it's, you know, it speaks to the kind of thing you're getting at right now. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a reach to think that the metaphorical understanding was kind of intended. I mean, you know, pretty clearly these are, or at least a kind of metaphorical understanding was intended. I mean, pretty clearly these are the kinds of things, you know, desire for, yeah. uh, you know, for uh, physical gratification, fear of threatening things. You know, these are the kinds of, uh, y- you know, the, the things that we have to come to terms with and change our relationship to if we're going to, you know, follow the prescriptions in the Dharma and certainly if we're going to attain enlightenment, but even if we're going to fall short of that. Um, Which we will. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't think it's a reach in that sense. I mean, I'm not sure you're saying exactly that. Your, metaf- your metaphor may be a little different from, from that, I, or, or the way you see this translating into everyday practice may be a little different from that. But I don't think a, a metaphorical reading of that is uh, a, a big stretch. Right. So, you know, back to your, your initial point, question around integration, you know, the, and the, the mistake I made it for years, which was trying to maintain, I, I would want to maintain the, the kind of the superhuman mindfulness that I developed on retreat mm-hmm. yeah. into daily life. And that was just a setup. That's right? not realistic. No, it's not realistic. So it's, you got to kind of let go of that in a certain sense. And, um, And the thing I want to, would want to say to anybody is, you know, lead, let the intentions that brought you on the retreat and let the intentions that kind of motivate your practice, let them, let, like, put those front and center, let the intentions do the work for you. Not so much whether you like something that is simple as like say, Oh, double the amount of time that you meditate every day or have five minutes where you're going to wash your dishes with as much attention as you can. Like you can, people get into the, the, the list making of tips for how to be more mindful in daily life. Mm-hmm. That's for me, that's all downstream to sort of, sort of the bigger intentions. Like what are you trying to establish as an orientation in your life? Yeah. I mean, I do, I'm not ready to let go of the importance of, a certain commitment to discipline. Um, like, yes, I'm going to do my morning sit every morning and I'm going to try to remember that when certain kind of situations arise, rather than say, go stuff myself full of chocolate to deal with it or something, or like I'm having trouble concentrating on my work at least one time a day, what I'll do is just try to sit for five or 10 minutes and see if that helps. You know, th- those kinds of commitments, I actually still think are important uh, in, um, in in carrying something from the retreat, some measure of what you got on the retreat into uh, everyday life. I know I don't disregard that. I don't, like having the having the, the the little mini practices, the micro practices to to try to reinforce. Yeah. Things that's fine. My my bigger thing is just what is the bigger intention? Yeah. Um, and I think if when when techniques get prioritized ahead of the intentions, that's where people can I think create unnecessary. So what would that what would that be like? You mean you would have lost sight of the point of it all, or what? Yeah, like I mean, I mean, this comes back to what what goes on in people's meditation. But I think it's it's far more interesting to me to to promote intentions of being curious and interested and tolerant and gentle towards whatever's going on mm-hmm. than it is to say achieve 12 consecutive breaths. Mm-hmm. I agree. And I agree that, and you know, I, I, I got a renewed, I did an event with John Kabat-Zinn about a year or more ago in, um, you know, he of course is a person who came up with uh um, mindfulness based stress reduction and did a lot to turn mindfulness into a thing, 
but because he did allow people to divorce it from its Buddhist context. And that opened all kinds of institutions up to mindfulness meditation and so, so on. But um, I, I was reminded again, talking to him of, of the importance of just trying to carry the philosophy with you. Like in your everyday life, um, you get into situations and, you know, um, just try to remember the, the you know, <laughs> the, uh, even things as mundane as stop and smell the roses. Uh, but, you know, um, and just remember that whatever state of mind you're in is a state of mind. And, and just, just try to, you know, try to carry those things, uh, into everyday life that, that off the cushion, uh, that can be as important as the amount of time you're spending on it. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, I think, I try to when it, when when I give people instructions for leaving retreat or suggestions for it's not really instructions but suggestions it's more think of the meditation as a way to reinforce or realign with those primary intentions you have for your life mm-hmm. you know and it's sort of an internalization of the goal like you there's something like, there's things where you can't control everything and you have some influence but you can't control it and so how do you align internally almost in a stoic kind of way the line internally around how you want to be with certain things and and that that's kind of what's what's driving your your uh, ship yeah i mean i think it's good to use so so for- like so even like with like having a distracted sitting where you're 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 or you're not very focused you can even if like say let's say you sit for 30 minutes and 29 of those minutes you're out to lunch but in one moment or in one minute of that sitting, you actually reconnected with intention to try to be present and to try to be interested and try to be curious around it. To me, that's, that's reinforcing that, that, that primary intention Mm -hmm. in in a positive way. No, every, every moment like that is in a sense, money in the bank. I mean, right. Yeah. Do, um, Do you, one thing I was wondering if we want to get into is just sort of, those that might be going on retreat, if we if if we if we came up with a, uh, a sort of a list of advice or tips, <laughs> I'm just now contradicting myself for like not being too tip tip uh, tip have happy. But are there things that you tell yourself, like things that you want to have in line to have like a supportive experience on retreat? Oh, uh... and I and I, I made a few lists here, but like. Physically, what do you recommend to people that they look after their body in a particular way or, or things be aware of things that may happen to their body while they're on a retreat? Well, you may get sore in certain places, you know, if you're, especially if you're sitting on a cushion, which I mainly did, uh, sometimes resorted to a chair. Uh, um, and that's that, that's one that, you know, I do recommend people experiment with like that, the, the, not to fixate on the posture. Like there's really, there's no privileged posture that you need to be in. You can sit cross-legged kneeling two two cushions, three cushions right. chair. It's all fine. Just to anybody that going in, if they can just dispense with the idea that they have to be sitting in a full Lotus position to be effective. That's, that's not helpful. Yeah. I, I mean, I would say though on my first retreat, and of course, I'm sure you're aware there are traditions in which they think all, you know, strict adherence to all these postures is important. And, you know, if, if, you, if you start leaning to one side, your, your master will like whip you or something from, you know, I mean, you can find all kinds of traditions. Um, and I do think my very first retreat when I was, you know, younger and more limber, um, and I did everything by the book. Pretty much same posture every time, uh, and uh, strictly adhere to the schedule. I think that was productive on that occasion. Now, at my age, with my back now, I need to spend some of the time doing the sits in a chair, for example. And I think uh, I'd be crazy not to take advantage of that flexibility. But um, I don't know. I, I think we should also say, if we're talking to complete beginners. You know, all retreat centers are different. And with any any one retreat center, 
unless it's like a Goenka center where like all the instruction is basically on videotape, it's cookie cutter, it's all the same. In most retreat centers, who the teachers are will matter. The, 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 the retreats may have different themes. There may be a loving kindness retreat and then a straight on mindfulness retreat. The different teachers have different qualities. You may happen to mesh with them. For my first retreat, I happened to have an opportunity to preview the teachers because they were doing a one-day sitting in my area. Yep. So before I committed to the one week with them, I had seen them, and I knew that I didn't, like, actively dislike them. And so that was important. Yeah. You know, no, I made, a, I made a note about that, that anyone that's sh- in the, in shopping for a retreat to do what you just described, to either get contact with the, the, the leaders of the retreat beforehand, make sure that it seems like a good fit. Um, but at the places we've gone, uh, you could also, someone could go on to an archive of talks. Right, like Dharma Seed. Dharma Seed.org, and they can listen to, they could, they, so for example, they could look at the schedule of retreats, see who's teaching what retreats, and then yeah. sample the talks and get a sense of like, is this, because te- there are certain teachers in, I'll admit that this way they speak or the way they kind of voice things drives me crazy. Like I just mm-hmm. couldn't sit with them. They're probably, and they're perfectly good teachers for somebody else. So it, it really is sort of a, a very personal thing and, and it's worth. Yeah. Like, these little- days you can pretty much any teacher of any repute, there will be uh, stuff online. Yeah. You know, you can hear what one of their Dharma talks sounds like or their guided meditation sounds like or something, and you can get a real sense. And I think that's important. And and I, connected to that, my uh, my wife actually mentioned this too to me this morning. It's like encouraging people not to to disown their critical faculties in regard to what the teacher might be saying. Yeah. Right? Because there's a way that, you know, sometimes it, you, you – can create unnecessary stress in that you just are, you feel like you can't have a critical thought because that's being judgmental. And (laughs) and then you're, you're, I've always managed to overcome that. It's, that hasn't been a problem with me. Uh, but you're, no, I, I I agree. And I, I mean, there's one thing we should say is like when you're in a retreat, the teachers have a lot of power because you're you're there day after day after day, and maybe there's a touch of Stockholm syndrome. But that aside, you can't talk to anybody else. Like normally, if a teacher is too unpopular, the students start talking about it, and there can be a rebellion or something, or at least you know people share your view. In situations like this, you don't really know how other people are reacting. There's usually no evidence that anyone is reacting adversely to anything the teacher is saying. As a result, the teachers have a whole lot of power, and yeah. I think maybe one thing you're saying is don't too readily fall under that sway. I mean, look, IMS has like an impeccable reputation, I think, in terms of so far as worrying about the extreme things like sexually abusive teachers and so on. I've never heard of anything remotely like that at IMS. Um, But but actually, even at IMS, I've had a case and, and this is a teacher we both know where I thought. Uh, it was a teacher who was um, kind of lecturing us that he was unsatisfied with kind of how little progress a lot of students seemed to have made or something, what they weren't. And, and I thought it was almost, he was almost getting like not fair because they really have a lot of power. And um, I, I, I thought maybe he wasn't aware of how much that was probably hurting some of the students in a way that wasn't particularly productive. So, yeah, I would say main, maintain your critical faculties. Uh, mine or my critical faculties are sufficiently stubborn um, that that hasn't been a problem for me. But it's, I think it's an asset, to be honest. Well, it has its pros and cons, but um, it, it, it certainly ensures that uh, if any meditation teacher ever asks me to give them a lot of money or something, <laughs> it won't happen. Um, uh, well, you know, connected to that, though, you you, you were talking about how, say, a, a teacher with a certain amount of charisma is is saying things you may have problems with. And, you, and you, you know, if you look at everybody else, you can't really see, you can't get a read of where they're at. There is a way that um, something that I, I, I have thought might be problematic for a new person is just and it's a subtle thing but there's a way that 
retreatants, there is a way that people get into a performative mode on retreat. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I want to be, I don't want to shame anyone that they're listening to this. They may fall into this category, but there's, and I've certainly done it myself. And I think actually the reason we connected because I was, I was probably exceptionally performative when we met and that I was trying to be the most mindful person in the room to be right. Because if you think about it on a retreat, there's no, the only metric you have or you can, that you can display how mindful you are is by external performance. Like you could. (laughs) So what, like you always walk slowly and deliberately. Uber slow. Like it takes you an hour and a half to get down a bowl of oatmeal. Right. Every bite is, is just exquisitely blissful. Which by the way, to some extent can happen on retreat. It can. Yeah. But to an outsider, and this is what I was trying to imagine too, is like from an outsider that, that can feel kind of exclusive. Like there's, there's this code of being that yeah. kind of form takes, takes form on retreat that c- could be a little potentially off putting. And just to know that if, if someone were to feel that way, it's pretty normal to feel that way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, at the same time, I think often it'll happen that in the course of a retreat, I mean, it's natural to be judgmental of the people you see at retreat. I mean, I remember my first retreat, like, you know, it's so funny. You you know, you you have no evidence. No one's talking. You have no evidence as to what they're actually like. And yet you're looking around making these judgments. And I remember there was a guy who had a Juilliard T-shirt on. And I thought, oh, Juilliard. Well, aren't we special, right? And And then at the end of the retreat, there was when the silence was broken and people were getting up and asking questions, he turned out to be the most obviously like timid, insecure person. So of course that judgment had been wrong, but I, 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 my initial judgment, but I would also say by the end of the retreat, you're, you may well be as I was feeling less judgmental generally. And that's, that's one of the, um, the welcome effects of a retreat if, if it happens, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't chastise yourself for your initial naturally critical appraisal of things and people. Right. But you may notice that changing over the course of the retreat and that's good. Yeah, no, and that's, and that's something that I've, I've always been impressed by because you know I'm one of these people that starts a retreat and there's a hundred people there. 98 are probably bugging me. Yeah. Right. And, yep. and then by the end there is this change where it's like, wow, they're part of the, we're all part of the family together. Kind of. Yeah. Um, and that, there is this whole con- uh, phenomenon known as the Vipassana romance, Vipassana vendetta. Well, yeah, yeah, you get, you might, you might get a crush on somebody, and you might come to hate somebody, and uh, all within silence, without knowing their name, without <laughs> right. And then, if you wind up talking to them, in either case, afterwards, you'll realize you had built up this whole picture that's wrong, and. The person you were in love with is not actually your type and so on. That's usually the case. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you know you had a case where it wasn't the case. Did that work out well? Uh, yeah, actually. Well, was, I, I didn't know about this phenomenon, but my first, first retreat going way back, I, there was a Vipassana romance that turned into a real life romance. Hey, congratulations. Yeah. Six months though. Six months and then it fell apart. Well, everything is impermanent. True. I hope you explained that to her. <laughs> she explained that to me, actually, when she uh, <laughs> wow. sent me the Dear Josh letter. Somebody's got to do the explaining. Right. Well, we should uh, – this has been um, more than an hour and a half. Uh, oh, wow. Which is not, not quite a record for us, but – We were probably in our own samadhi state, uh, yeah, oblivious, we, we oblivious to the passage of time. This is the way a good sit is. You lose total track of time. Um, but uh, I hope – well, I hope somebody made it to the end. Um, I hope, uh, I don't think this has become the kind of the definitive guide to retreats, but I hope it's helpful to both the people who have never been on them and maybe even to some who have been. Yeah, no, um, I mean, the retreats are hot now. I mean, the joke that was forming in my mind before we got on the call was that prior to you coming on the scene, I thought I was the biggest influencer sending people to IMS. To the insight <laughs> meditation. So then you came and you stole my thunder and, you know, you became, you, 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 I couldn't compete with your evangelism. Uh, well, also, I mean, like, you know, Dan Harris's book, 10% Happier. 
he mentions IMS and, and of course, Spirit Rock, which is the, right. the IMS of California, the Insight Meditation Society of California. Um, which, which, by the way, apparently Jack Dorsey has been there. And since that has occurred, I, some of the retreats at Spirit Rock have wait lists of about five to 600 people. Well, well, Jack Dorsey did a retreat in, I think, you know, Myanmar and got a certain amount of blowback for his describing it in a way that had no evident awareness of, you know, what had happened in Myanmar involving some Buddhists right. and some other ethnic groups. Um, the, uh, well, I was taught, I, you know, before I, the silence began in my retreat, I stopped by and saw Joseph Goldstein, the co- co-founder of IMS. And he said, you know, it's just off the charts. The, you know, you can tell by going to the site, how long the waiting list, you know, how long in advance often yeah. you have to sign up. And, um, so yeah, it's a happening thing. Uh, and, and, and I just, I think it's a, for my money, it's a really worth, nothing is guaranteed. You can have a very bad time at one, but, for my money, even if you, I mean, if you go there and do what most people have, which is a really memorable, interesting, and largely good time, even if you don't even sustain a practice after that, I think it's valuable just to, as a way to um, realize what kinds of states of consciousness are possible. And I think you'll probably, and I think probably if you do it, you will become convinced that some of these states of mind are really more valid states of mind than the states we often bring to the world and are more conducive to the well-being of sentient beings, (laughs) including you and so on. And even if you don't have a practice and it's just good almost as a proof of concept, it's, you know, as a, as a, just to understand what's what's possible and, and, and just remember that our ordinary state of consciousness is uh, Mixed probably bag. not something you should, you should get too wrapped up in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, I think the, the retreat experience reliably for many people, not, not it's not going to work for everybody as we have established, but for many people, it will give them a reliable taste of possibility um, which whether they meditate beyond that or not is, I think, um, can open up some doors into to new ways of being. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, and then this is where I think there, there is some potential overlap with the psilocybin research where people who do one big trip, you know, have this big shift and it, it, you don't need recurring dosing to, to sustain the, uh, the shift that occurs from that. Right. At the same time, there's something interesting to me about the fact that the state of mind you attain on a retreat is attainable without ingesting anything. That, that is amazing to me. And, um, and, and, it, and it also it just does have, I think, different qualities probably from any that are not necessarily better or worse, but are different from any particular kind of chemically induced experience. Um, well, and that comes back to something a, a teacher we've both had. I remember him saying once that if you took a like a think tank, cr- created a think tank at a place like MIT and put all top thinkers into the room and said, devise a, a, a fail-proof system for reliable happiness, people probably wouldn't come up with something as simple and as unflashy as sit down, right. pay, pay attention right. in a sustained way. Who said that, Rodney? That was uh, Michael Grady. Oh, yeah, Michael Grady. Grady. He was my first uh, at my first retreat. Uh, like I said, I, I, through intense uh, samadhi, near the end, I had an amazing kind of psychedelic-like experience that seemed like entering my mind and looking around. And I, I like at, at the end of the retreat, I told him about it. Like I was like, I thought he was going to say I'd attain enlightenment or something. He said. Sounds nice, but don't get attached to it. That was it. Well, <laughs> oh well. So, but, uh, go ahead. What were you gonna say? I was gonna say, you know, the attachment's inevitable. Like, so that that's that's where I would ding him for, like, don't get attached. Like, you're you're gonna get, everyone's gonna get attached. These things, yeah, but, but get I, hooked. But the point is to get 
familiar with that process of how you get hooked. And, and, and not keep pursuing that particular state I had. Right. Maybe. I mean, I don't, I, I, you know, I think there's, there's potential. <laughs> there's I mean, I, I would actually like to do a retreat where I did like pursue like jhana states and stuff. And it, and it was about concentration and absorption and bliss. And that would be fun. Yeah. And then you might find that. <laughs> then I got tired of it. Well, no, that it's actually harder when they're, when it's, when it's in the, in the crosshairs. When, you when, put it's, the like, yeah. when it's the goal, it's like, it's, it's more elusive. So I would, I would try not to try then and that would work. Okay. So good luck on your, uh, retreat, teaching your, uh, your kind of meditation retreat. Yeah. It's this, five is days. Four, this is for yoga teachers. It's, it's part of the, the training in my yoga school, but it's open to people that okay. are just want to do a retreat. So, so good. Follow all your advice. Uh, I'll follow some of your advice too. I doubt that. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> you never know. I can change my mind, Bob. Okay. Well, thanks. And uh, again, your your podcast is Everyday Sublime. People should go to what is, is it? Josh Summers dot com. It's S U M M E R S, like the season. Is it dot com? You said someone else got com. I got dot net. You got dot net, and see your list of retreats and stuff. Sure. And, uh, and cause you are like, uh, one of the hottest yin yoga people in the very hot yin yoga space. <laughs> <laughs> Which is ironic cause yin is the cooler side of it. It's like, Oh, cool. is it the cooler side of yoga? Shows yeah. you what I know about yoga, but I'm getting, I'm getting there. I'm getting yeah. the word yoga. This the fact that you're just saying those words is a sign of improvement. Yeah, I know. Well, I got this plantar fasciitis thing that is leading me to think I should look into yoga. But I digress. Well, that's your fascia, inflammation of your fascia. I know, and yin yoga is all about dealing with the fascia. Exactly. It I is. know these things. So <laughs> you need to follow your own advice. I, I, I'm trying. It's so hard. Yeah. If, if it came from a more credible person, it would be easy. But alas, well, thank you, Josh. Thanks. Thanks to you, Bob. And we'll see you next time. Great to see you.